Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I have to say that the best thing is to start with the program because Juan and Mars and Francis have put together such a fantastic list of speakers that, uh, you know, you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to them, and then let's talk about it. But just on the issue that we've just discussed, let me say that I'm for longevity with health and happiness. Uh, and that's, you know, what uh, Alvaro just said is very important. If you're buying into longevity uh, and you're going to have several of those extra months or a few years of extra life with uh, uh, tremendous uh, 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 lack of health and with unhappiness, then we're not doing much. So we, ne we need to combine, combine those. Um, so uh, what I would, uh, uh, th the program is great, as I say, it covers a huge uh, range. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that over the next two days, we're going to think very carefully about some of those real advances and some of the things that appear advances, but may really not be so. Um, one of the things that I would like to start with is make a big distinction between the things in which we can do, from my perspective as a neuroscientist and neurologist, the, the, the areas where we can have a huge impact and really make lives better. Uh, and that has actually to do with movement. Movement is very interesting because it happens in a very special world where there are coordinates that are very well defined uh, and where we can operate with a certain degree of confidence. Um, I'm, I'm not so keen, as I was a few years ago, uh, on, on having comparable uh, uh, improvements in the area of mind and consciousness. You know, there was a time I actually thought it was, would be perfectly reasonable to expect a development of artificial consciousness. Uh, and in the developments even of creatures that would be conscious and, and entirely artificial. Uh, I have to tell you that I don't think that is possible. Uh, I don't think that I believe that anymore. And that has to do with uh, having uh, gotten a, a better idea, I think, of what it is that makes us conscious. Us, you know, we're not talking about any other creatures. And what makes us conscious really depends so much on true biology, on wet biology, on chemistry, uh, and on the natural regulations of homeostasis, and on the expression of those regulations in the form of feeling, homeostatic feeling, that I don't think we're going to be able to achieve that in any kind of engineered machine, even if the machine is going to be very complex, even if it can mimic many of the things that are necessary to build a consciousness, which clearly require a monitoring of the internal environment of any organism, real, uh, natural, biological, or manufactured. Um, so my, my expectations on the world of mind are more uh, limited precisely because it is such a wide world and so extraordinary. The, um, on the other hand, on the world of movement, I think there's, there are great possibilities. And I wanted to, to bring up a little story which has to do with work uh, that I admire. Uh, and this is work uh, that is done at uh, the PFL and uh, Shuv in Lausanne and has to do with the improvements in relation to paralysis. Uh, and of course, everyone in this room knows that if you, you can have a very fine brain, but if you have an accident, that cuts your spinal cord at whatever level, you're going to end up either with a paraplegia, which is paralyzed in the, in the movement of the two, two, limb, two inferior limbs, uh, or even tetraplegia, in which you can be paralyzed below the level of the neck and you don't walk anymore. And this has been, of course, a huge tragedy for many people, and very often for people that are very young, because obviously accidents happen at any age, but if you have an accident that happens when you are 20 or 30, you will be paralyzed for the rest of your life. And so it's very interesting because in two papers, actually, that you can read, they're both in Nature, one from last year, one quite recent from this year, you can see an approach that I think is a model of what can be done realistically. And what they, what they did, and this is a, a, a group that is directed by 
Grégoire uh, uh, Courtine uh, in Lausanne, uh, what they did was take a number of people that were paraplegic, both legs without movement, after accidents, fairly young, uh, and they applied a patch, an electric stimulation patch, uh, into the spinal cord, it's a, 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 a patch that will do the electrical stimulation and that will provoke a variety of neurons in the spinal cord to operate. So even if there is a transaction, a cut between the communication of the brain to the spinal cord, there is a possibility of going electrically into the spinal cord and stimulating neurons that are healthy and were not damaged and make them work. And what is interesting in the work is that they, they succeeded. They had this patch. The, the movement was restored. Uh, and instead of just believing that the neurons that were, uh, that were activated were the neurons that had been idle for several years, they actually went further and studied, uh, attempted to study which neurons were really involved. And what they came up with was something very interesting, is that the neurons that were involved were not the ones that normally would have operated to make movement in the legs, but actually another sector, another pool of neurons. Uh, and then they did, again, something that I find from the point of view of method quite admirable, is that they went into an animal model to find out what was really going on. Uh, and the conclusion, to make a long story short, is that what the electrical stimulation was provoking was activity in a pool of neurons that was, had been idle and that were literally either being engaged in movement or teaching the other neurons to operate. And this is really quite sensational. So it's not that you were just going there to the repository of neurons <coughs> that had not been working, but you actually had a spare group that was able to be engaged and literally teach other neurons how to operate. And this is actually quite interesting. And the most recent work, which obviously goes in this, the same chain, has to do with patients. And so far, one patient has been reported uh, that is tetraplegic, and where they went and not only had a patch in the spinal cord so that you could create movement over there, but then they also had electrodes in the motor cortex. And they had the possibility of finding what kind of activity in the motor cortex was preceding the movement in the legs. And actually, sort of key into intentions of movement, picked up electrically from the spinal cord, and then create a, a, create a bridge between what was going on in, the, in the, the cerebral cortex and in the spinal cord. So uh, recognizing a pattern that uh, signified an intent to move could tell the, the, uh, the activation patch in the spinal cord to uh, attempt those movements. And this is quite remarkable because, in fact, this succeeded. And again, I want to be cautious. Don't try to extrapolate this brilliant uh, uh, set of uh, uh, experiments and studies, don't try to extrapolate it to anything uh, uh, other than movement at the time, because I doubt very much it will be possible. But it certainly uh, gives you an idea of what can be done if you're serious about studying the problem, and if you're serious about finding ways, uh, harnessing all the aspects we now have of biology, both in animal models and in humans, to uh, come to a result that is quite brilliant. And I know that Alvar will tell us uh, uh, things that are very much in the same vein from his own work, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to, to hear that. Then, be before I shut up, uh, a couple of things of why am I worried, or not worried, why am I not so keen on consciousness, uh, uh, having the same possibility. The, the first is, is this, huge, uh, uh, this huge difference in scale between what goes on in a mind uh, and, and what goes on in a conscious mind, which is a mind that naturally, that naturally realizes that, belongs in a, that it belongs in a certain body. Because, by the way, as a parenthesis, uh, a lot of the discussions that have to do with consciousness, which are, seem to be uh, 
growing in intensity, and especially now after the, 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 the recent developments of the, the chatbots, um, it is quite amazing the number of people that think that from there to creating an artificial consciousness is going to be a simple step, and of course it's nothing of the sort. Um, but so uh, what, what is interesting is that when you think about what consciousness really is, it's not about mind, about knowledge, about uh, uh, having a, a, a sense of reasonableness about the world. It's really and quite simply about the possibility of connecting a mental process to one specific living organism. What, what it is to me to be conscious and to anyone in this room is, to, is this fact. You have a mind and automatically, spontaneously, you know that your mind belongs in your body. Sounds very simple, but it's not simple at all. You can only do that because at the same time that you are alive, you have homeostatic feelings, feelings such as hunger, thirst, the plain feeling of existence, the feeling of body temperature, uh, pain, all of those feelings that have to do with the regulation of the organism, with the regulation of life in an organism, all of those feelings are telling you spontaneously and automatically, guess what, you belong here. Everything that is happening in your mind is co-located in your body. And this is an incredible achievement and is something that, of course, organisms that don't have nervous systems cannot do, but organisms with complex nervous systems, such as we are, can do. And that really is extraordinary. So my big problem is that if you're dealing with organisms that do not have um, um, organ artificial organisms, that do not have this biology, even if I mean, you, you can say something the other day, somebody was telling me when I expressed these doubts, said, well, you know, Everything comes from code. We come from a biological code. Uh, so uh, we can, of course, using other kinds of codes, we can create these creatures, and why, why should they not be conscious? Well, the issue is not coming from code. The issue is what, be, what is being coded. And the, the, sub, the substrate is absolutely critical in that domain. And uh, there's nothing in what we can at the moment do, to my knowledge, but I, I might learn otherwise, uh, in terms of artificial worlds where we could create the equivalent of the, of the chemistry-based and biologically-based feelings that we have in our organism and that allow us to have, uh, to have all of that uh, marvelous uh, consciousness. And uh, just uh, one, since we are, I think we're going to be very enthusiastic uh, about uh, uh, all of these themes, uh, but just to sound a, a little bit of a note of caution, uh, again, reminding me because of the chatbots. The enthusiasm about, about the chatbots is interesting because um, all of a sudden, people think that they are really entering a world of, of cognition that is very similar to ours. Uh, and I don't think that that's the case. To begin with, what we enter, or what chatbots allow you to enter in terms of cognition, is a world of language. You know, we really are talking about large language models, these large-scale language models. And it's very funny because you, you come out of this huge universe of language that is available in the internet, and that, of course, gives you a tremendous amount of information, but you're you're, you're sort of uh, uh, unconnected to the concepts that are underneath. You know, it means when, when I look at some of the discussions on, on chatbots, it makes me think to the days of Chomsky arguments on language and concepts. Uh, so we, we're forgetting that there's this layer of nonverbal concepts that is what really supports our cognition, our knowledge about the world, and we're going exclusively to the level of language. And then, of course, because of that, you end up with some extraordinary uh, results, uh, some filled with, uh, with falsity and, and lies. Uh, and, and some of them actually very funny. You know, it's, when, when you look at the inventions that chatbots are producing, 
and the, what is false in the middle of what is correct, it's very funny. Um, but it is a world with its own dangers, and by no means is it the world that is going to uh, uh, open up the fields in relation to human creativity and to things like human mind uh, and human consciousness. So, um, again, I'm for longevity, happiness, and what is it? Well, health. Very important, so that we maintain it. And uh, that's it, just for the beginning, and uh, I think we're going to have a spectacular meeting because you have all sorts of incredible people and incredible contributions to be heard. Thank you.